All right, well, thank you. And uh, thank you to uh, Anna for arranging this. And I'm really glad that uh, I'm able to be here. And uh, so uh, the, uh, I've sort of been on a, uh, a lecture tour uh, in, you know, the past month or so. Uh, Giving uh, you know, and 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 the 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 reason is that you know there this is a hugely exciting time for uh, quantum computation, as many of you uh, probably heard or read about uh, a few months ago. There was a team at Google that uh, announced the uh, achievement of a milestone that we call quantum computational supremacy. Okay. Um, well, you know, this term, quantum supremacy, was coined by uh, my good friend, the physicist John Preskill, in 2012. Uh, if anyone finds the term, like, obnoxious or offensive or anything, uh, I ask you to blame him and not blame me. Okay? I'm just going to, you know, you, you know uh, uh, use the term uh, that, that, you know, it was sort of this come to, I guess, uh, it sort of came to catch on. And wh what Preskill meant by it, and uh, what I'll also mean by it is sort of the first use of a quantum computer to do some well some well defined calculation, something you know with a well defined answer, uh, where uh, um, we have some reasonable confidence that it is doing it much much faster than any existing classical computer on Earth, you know, could do the same thing, or at least with any type of algorithm that we currently know. Okay, so uh, you know this is a relative milestone. You may notice, like it is not quite like landing on the moon, uh, because you know first of all it's something that could be achieved and then unachieved. If so, if later someone finds that there is a much better classical algorithm to do it than we thought, right? Uh, you know it is a more uh, milestone like you know uh, um, Deep Blue beating Kasparov in chess. Right? It is, you know, there, there may be, you know, like a few years where computers and humans are kind of comparable in chess. You know, the, uh, uh, you know, you have to squint to see which one is better. Okay, but, you know, you know, you know if there is a uh, close competition in one year, like in that case in 1996, 1997, then given the improvement in technology, one can reliably predict that in a few years' t time, there will be no competition, right? That the computers will just leave the humans in the dust, as, as happened then, okay? And uh, so it's a, similarly with uh, quantum supremacy, right? If, you know, the largest supercomputers on Earth are, you know, struggling, you know, now to simulate what we can do with a small quantum computer, then, you know, then, uh, uh, um, um, you know, given given the rate at which you know quantum com uh, computing hardware is improving, then you know we hope to just uh, uh, you know have it have it not even be close very soon. Okay, so um, now notice that I did not say anything about the uh, problem solved by the quantum computer being useful. Okay, uh, so you know quantum supremacy is a milestone, is you know kind of like the Wright brothers' airplane. Okay, you know, which was not a very useful airplane by, you know, for, you know, ferrying passengers or, you know, it was built just to prove a point. Or, you know, if you like, it was built to disprove the people who said that a heavier than air flying machine was not possible. Okay, and in the same way, you know, like I, I, I've like I, I've always joked that for me, the number one application of a quantum computer is not any of the things that you read about, you know, in the press of, you know, you know, uh, 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 machine learning optimization, uh, you know, or even even uh, 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 simulating quantum mechanics or breaking public key cryptography, right? Those are the things where a quantum computer really will be a complete, you know, total game changer, okay? But, uh, but even those are not really the applications that I personally care about. I care about disproving the people who said that quantum computing was impossible. Okay, uh, you know, I care about sort of directly confirming, you know, that the world really is governed by this exponential, you know, that the state of the world really is a vector in an exponentially large Hilbert space. Okay, and you know, that, that you cannot get by with any sort of, you know, replacement of that picture by something, you know, more classical. Okay, or, you know, if, you know, I, I, I often say that the most exciting possible outcome of quantum computing research would be to discover that it can't be done. Right? 
because that would be a revolution in fundamental physics, right? You know, to, uh, uh, if quantum mechanics itself has to change in some way, if there is some new principle on top of quantum mechanics that prevents you from ever building a quantum computer, then that is really revolutionary. You know, the uh, hypothesis that you can build a quantum computer and it will work is the boring one. It's the conservative possibility, okay? But, you know, we still have to test it, just like with, with finding the Higgs boson, just like with finding gravitational waves, you know, one has to directly confirm that nature does have this computational capacity. So that's what, that's what uh, uh, this milestone is about. Okay, so let's now talk more concretely about what the Google group did or what they claim to have done, okay? And then we'll get into the mathematical aspects. Okay, so, um, Okay, so they built a, uh, a chip uh, they call Sycamore, uh, which uh, has uh, 53 quantum bits on it, 53 qubits. Uh, uh, if, you're at, if you're wondering why 53, well, they built 54 and one of them didn't work. Okay, uh, but uh, they are, the, 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 these are qubits that are, you know, are, uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, physically, what they are are you know they are states of uh, current that flows around a uh, uh, a little coil. Uh, uh, you know the coils uh, uh, are arranged in roughly a rectangular grid. Okay, so uh, um, you know th you know think of think of the qubits as just uh, um, uh, 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 being arranged on a lattice, where each qubit can interact directly with its nearest neighbors. Okay, so something like this, and um, uh, uh, the uh, you know so 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 each each coil can uh, store current in two different s states that we can you know uh, 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 represent as a zero and a one. Okay, and uh, they uh, the the coils are connected with something called Josephson junctions that you know, lets the current of one depend on the current of its neighbors, so they can interact with each other. Um, and now, crucially, this chip is placed in a dilution refrigerator, and it is cooled to about 10 millikelvin, okay? So, you know, hundredth of a degree above absolute zero. And uh, that causes these currents to superconduct, okay? So, and when they superconduct, well, they lose their resistance, but more importantly for us, they can be in superpositions of the zero state and the one state, okay? So, in other words, they start to behave as qubits as quantum mechanical bits. And um, if I have 53 qubits and they can interact with each other in some arbitrary way, then what quantum mechanics tells us is that the state of those qubits, you know, like a full description of them, and let's just assume for simplicity that it was perfectly isolated from the environment, you know, which of course in practice it's not. But if it was, then the state of this object would be a unit vector in C to the 2 to the 53, okay? So, uh, and the reason for that is that quantum mechanics tells us that we need one amplitude for every possible configuration of all 53 of the bits. So for every 53-bit string, right? 2 to the 53 is about 9 quadrillion. Okay, so to describe the state of this chip, you know, if, if it's, Oper, you know, uh, if, if the theory is right, uh, takes a vector of about nine quadrillion complex numbers, okay? Um, and, you know, this is just the cat notation. This is just the notation for unit vectors. And, um, uh, and now what you can do is you can do a sequence of unitary transformations that will change you know, this state that will, uh, uh, you know, just a, a bunch of norm-preserving linear transformations to this state vector. And the way we do that is by uh, turning on, you know, couplings uh, between uh, neighboring qubits or just, you know, local operations within a single qubit at a time. Um, Mathematically, if I d wanted to do like a, an operation on one qubit, I re you know, so, so every operation that I do on the qubits, I can think of as a 2 to the 53 by 2 to the 53 unitary matrix, right, that is then, that is going to act on this vector. So, you know, and map it to some other vector, uh, you call it U psi. Um, uh, the, vec the, the 
uh, transformations that I can actually feasibly implement are the ones that I build up out of local interactions. So for example, I could do some two qubit uh, operation on these two qubits here, which would then be represented by a four by four unitary matrix, right? And then that would be, that could be tensored with the identity transformation on all of the remain, you know, the, the other 51 qubits. Yes? Yeah. Well, quantum mechanics, in some sense, gives us this. Okay, that is, these are what amplitudes are. And this is what quantum mechanics has told us since 1926 is the most fundamental reality that there is, these complex numbers, these amplitudes, okay? If you want to know how they are physically represented, you will have to ask God, okay? Don't ask me, okay? <laughs> okay? So, um, um, uh, yeah, so what was I saying? So, 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 you know, you can, um, you can, you can do a bunch of operations, you know, that couple these qubits with their neighbors. Um, so, uh, and, and, and we can do uh, a bunch of different operations in parallel on different sets of qubits. And the, you know, and, and then the total unitary transformation that's affected on this, you know, on this state here will just be the tensor product of you know, the, the, uh, the individual operations I'm doing. So for example, I could do uh, uh, a bunch of four by four unitary matrices like these. And then, like in a next step, after that was finished, I could do uh, uh, two qubit unitary transformations in a different pattern, like um, I could next uh, interact you know, these two and these two, and, and these two, and so forth, you know, and if I just, uh, uh, or next I could interact maybe these two, and these two, and if I just interleave in that way, then after a small number of such layers, every qubit will have been able to influence every other qubit, right? So I'll have like a fully connected uh, uh, network of interactions, right? And um, so, so I can do that, and then at the end, I can measure the qubits. Okay, I can, uh, so I, 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 sh I should mention, by the way, that all, all of this is fully controllable. Okay, if you walk into their lab, you'll see the dilution refrigerator, which is, you know, maybe the size of a closet or so, and then you'll see a bunch of classical, you know, a bunch of electronics outside the dilution fridge that are hooked up to just classical computers that are sending control signals into the, into the fridge, into the chip, to tell it which qubit should interact with which other one in exactly which way, at, at, at which time, right? So, so that is the sense in which this is a computer, right? That it is fully programmable, okay? Um, now, at, at the end, uh, we can make a measurement on each qubit that just asks it whether it's a zero or a one, okay? Now, uh, you know, I, in quantum mechanics, you never directly see these gigantic vectors, right? These, uh, uh, you know, the, these vectors of amplitudes, right? They live in Hilbert space, which, you know, in some sense is more fundamental to modern physics than the three-dimensional space of our experience, okay? But we never directly see it, right? As soon as we look, we only see objects that are localized in three-dimensional space. And the way that that happens is the famous Born rule of quantum mechanics, uh, or in other words, the collapse of the wave function, okay? And so what happens, so I can write a general quantum state, let's say of uh, uh, 53 qubits, like this. So, you know, uh, my basis vectors, my you know, orthonormal basis for this, uh, complex vector space will just be the labels of all the different 53-bit strings, you know, all two to the 53 of them. And, you know, each one gets its own complex valued amplitude. Okay, so this is just, this is just another notation for a, uh, a length two to the 53 vector. And now if I make a measurement to ask which, well, which string do I have, then the Born rule tells me that the, I will observe a given string x with probability equal to the squared absolute value of the amplitude of the string x, okay? And, and, you know, and I will then collapse the superposition. So then the state really will just be x at that point, 
Okay, so um, um, so 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 basically, the, you know, this this the point of this whole chip is just you know it, it will allow me to sample from various probability distributions over fifty three over the set of fifty three bit strings. Okay, uh, uh, namely whatever distributions I can produce in this manner. <laughs> Okay, by applying a sequence of local unitary transformations to my qubits. Uh, so, so let's say they have some initial state, which um, uh, for simplicity is usually taken to just be the all zero state, or in other words, uh, corresponding to this vector here, okay, where, you know, this dot 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 is a nine quadrillion, okay, and uh, uh, and then I can apply my sequence of unitary transformations, you know, one by one to this vector, in order to get my final vector, you know, my final amplitude vector, like that, and then I can measure, which then converts this complex vector into a vector of probabilities uh, which are then the probabilities that I actually see any of the possible 53-bit strings. Okay? And then, you know, once I've done that, I can, you know, I can do exactly the same thing again in order to get an independent sample from this same probability distribution. I can collect a bunch of samples from the distribution. Okay? Now, th this is, so this is sort of what the hardware gives me. I yeah. Uh, yeah, this, this, this is just measurement. This is just what happens in quantum mechanics when you make a measurement. This is a fundamental. Um, well, well, I mean, if I actually wanted to estimate each of these probabilities, that would be an unbelievable number of measurements. And in practice, I cannot do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that okay. I mean, that's the way that the uh, um, you know physicists think about it. They would think of the measurement outcomes as you know as 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 eigenstates, right? We can you know you know we we could capture that by just saying you know we are applying some larger you know uh, um, coupling between the you know qubits and their environment, but you know which will have the property that the zero vector and the one vector will be those eigenstates. Right, that's the, that, that's the point. Okay, so each time I run the experiment, I get a sample from this probability distribution here. Okay, now um, just to just to give some 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 notation, um, I could let C be the quantum circuit that we apply. So by a, a quantum circuit, I just mean a specification of all of the unitary operations that were to be applied, and, and in what order. Right, that, 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 that's what the term quantum circuit means. Uh, we typically uh, use a notation like this for them where you know, the qubits are arranged from top to bottom, time runs from left to right, and then the, uh, the, 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 the uh, two qubit gates that we want to apply you know, look like things like this. Okay? So we have a, a, a circuit. We can apply the same circuit over and over. I can then... Um, you know, uh, to let's say the all zero initial state, which would be zero tensored with itself 53 times. Okay, excuse me. Uh, well, I just, in some sense, I just showed you how. You, you initialize every qubit to the zero state. How do you initialize? That's the question for the engineers. Okay, what? Yeah, they can, they can initialize to the zero state. That is one of the most fundamental things that a useful qubit has to be able to do, right? That is basically just put the current into the state that we have decided to call zero. And if we couldn't reliably call it, if we couldn't have reliably put it into that state, well, then we wouldn't have used that as our zero state, okay? So, um, um, and then apply the sequence of operations, and then that gives you a final state you know, depending on the circuit, which we could call psi sub c, okay? And then we measure in the, you know, the uh, uh, computational basis to get a single classical string, and that'll be sampled from some probability distribution that we could call d sub c, right? You know, so, so like, I'll just let d sub c be this distribution here, okay? Uh, well, so uh, um, a measurement of each qubit in the zero-one basis. 
Yeah, absolutely it does. I mean, it, it basically, it destroys, when we make a measurement, that destroys the entire superposition, right? So I see x with probability absolute value of alpha x squared. But then the other thing that happens is that the entire state of those qubits collapses and is now x. Okay, if I look a second time, I'll just see x again. Okay, it is collapsed to x because I measured. So each time you have yeah. Of yeah. Then you get one right, exactly. So, you know, I have to choose the measurement carefully, but okay? I, ha I can measure all 53 of the qubits. Yeah. Okay, I can measure each of them, and you know, they could give me correlated results, right? I, you know, I get this distribution will in general not be a product distribution. It will be some very complicated correlated distribution on all 53 bits. What I get when I measure is a sample from that distribution. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, or, 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 rather, well, or, or more precisely, we could say the circuit determines the unitary transformation. There could be many different circuits that give rise to the same unitary transformation in the end. And the depth is equal to the number? The depth is equal to the number of layers like this one. The depth is the number of these things, right? So I can do a whole bunch of gates in, in parallel on, you know, on different disjoint pairs of qubits, and that adds one to the depth, right? That's, that's one more layer of gates, okay? So, so it's not the number of inner examples, the depth is The depth, right, that's right. The, de the, the number of gates will be a larger number. The number of gates will be like the number of layers times the number of gates in each layer, okay? In this case, let's say in the Google chip, there are 25 or 26 gates per layer, right? So the number of gates will just be the depth times 25 or 26. Okay? And what can be the layers is arbitrary? The la well, I, you know, the, I, I can choose, you know, I have enormous freedom in sort of, you know, not, not arbitrary freedom in the, in the actual chip built by Google, but I have a lot of freedom in choosing which gates to apply. Okay? So, um, you know, and I, I, can, I can, you know, reprogram the same chip to do a different circuit than, you know, than it, than it just did, right? What? Yeah, so, 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 good. so that's a good question. Let's get into that now. So yeah, so, so basically the, the, the larger the depth of the circuit, the more layers of gates, right, the, the better, you know, of a, more interesting of a, a computation I will be able to do, right? So well, why not just do depth a million or something? Well, the problem is that qubits are extremely fragile, okay? Uh, so I said before that when you measure, you collapse the superposition, right? The fundamental problem, you know, since the very beginning, you know, with actually building a quantum computer has been, well, it doesn't just have to be you who would measure or, or any conscious, you know, entity for that matter. Any interaction between the qubit and, the ex and, and its environment that has the effect of carrying away information about, for example, was that qubit a zero or a one, uh, will have the same effect on the qubit as if it was measured, okay? So, uh, so, so, you know, being in superposition is a thing that qubits or, you know, subatomic particles like to do in private when people, when no one is looking at them, okay? We know that they were doing it because, you know, when we look later, we see probability distributions over where they are that can only be explained by them having been in superposition states when we weren't looking, okay? But, um, you know, the, the superposi superpositions are inherently fragile things, right? And, and fundamentally, that is the reason why in everyday life we don't see superpositions, why we don't see, you know, Schrodinger's cats and, you know, that are, you know, in, in complex linear combinations of being alive and being dead, okay? It is because, you know, we are in effect constantly measuring each other and, you know, and, and, and being measured by our environment, by radiation, by the air in the room. And so, you know, it's of all, all the uh, parts of the everyday world that are, are constantly in interaction with each other and thereby constantly collapsing each other's quantum states. Okay, now, um, 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 qubits, you know, the goal is to keep them 
perfectly isolated from the rest of the universe, except, you know, insofar as they have to do the unitary transformations that you want them to do, right? Now, that is uh, ridiculously hard as an engineering problem. Uh, the only reason that we think that it is possible at all to build scalable quantum computers was a fundamental discovery in the uh, late 1990s called quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance, which basically says that you don't have to get the qubits perfectly isolated from their environments, you know, to do a scalable quantum computation. It is enough to get them very, very, very well isolated, okay? Uh, you know, it's so, so that you can use some very clever error correcting codes to have your noisy qubits sort of simulate or encode a logical qubits that are less noisy than they are. And then those qubits could simulate qubits that are less noisy still and so forth. Okay, so that was an amazing, you know, you know the, the sort of proof that that in, in principle could be done was an amazing theoretical achievement of the 90s that has still not been demonstrated experimentally, okay? We, you know, the qubits that we have today are orders of magnitude better than the best qubits that there were 20 years ago, by which I mean they are able to maintain their quantum states for orders of magnitude longer amounts of time. You know, they are able to, you know, one can do a desired one or two qubit operation on them with orders of magnitude less error than, than, you know, than would have been the case, you know, 20 years ago. Okay, but we are not yet at the levels of accuracy, uh, you know, where fault tolerance kicks in and where it lets you scale up to, you know, as many qubits as you want and doing as much on them as you want. Okay, so the way that I like to describe the situation is that we are now in 2020, we are now like finally entering the very early vacuum tube era of quantum computation. Like, you know, if you're like, you know, like optimistically, like this quantum supremacy thing marks finally the end of the Charles Babbage era and the beginning of the vacuum tube era. Okay, the, you know, quantum. It, 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 quantum error correction would be like the quantum computing version of the transistor. That has not been invented yet, okay? Uh, uh, that's just, you know, exists on paper, okay? But, you know, vacuum tube computers were somewhat useful, right? One could do some things with them, and likewise, people are going to try to do some things with the sort of noisy, you know, 50 or soon 100 or 200 qubit quantum computers that can be built uh, uh, in, in, you know, let's say uh, within the next decade. Okay, but now we come to the issue of depth. Okay, so, so the depth is going to be crucial. And the main issue is that the, um, the actual distribution that you're going to sample you know, is not going to be this D sub C. D sub C is the ideal distribution that you want to sample, but the real distribution that you'll see in the experiment will look more like this. It will look like one minus epsilon times U, the uniform distribution over all 53-bit strings. So in other words, just noise or garbage plus epsilon times D, uh, where D is, or D sub C, where this is the distribution that you want. And this epsilon is called the fidelity of the circuit. And, it, and it's going to go down exponentially with the depth of the circuit. Okay? So each layer of gates, you lose, you know, again, you lose more fidelity. Okay? Now, in the Google experiment, the hardest circuits for which they were still able to extract a signal, uh, they had a depth of 20. Okay, so 20 layers of gates, and the epsilon that they found in the experiment was about 0 0.002. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is a, uh, you know, uh, um, a, a small signal that is mostly swamped by noise. Okay, but the good news is that if I want to, like, see that I am not sampling from the uniform distribution, if I want to extract a signal, corresponding to this, the number of samples that I'm going to need in order to do that, uh, just by standard st statistics, is going to scale like 1 over epsilon squared. Okay? Uh, yes? Depth is the number of layers of gates. It's the number of things, yeah, it's the number of things like this that I apply. Tensor products of unitary transformations on disjoint pairs of qubits. So it means you cannot do more, Google could not do more than 20 unitary, irreducible unitary transformations without measuring? 
Uh, right. That's, well, 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 basically, the signal, as I was saying, gets exponentially attenuated with the depth. Okay, which means when your depth is too large, you can no longer see the signal. That is the issue. Okay? So when the depth is 20, the signal is like 1 in 500. Okay? Now, the good news is that you know, the, the, the hardware is very fast. Okay, taking each sample from this distribution uh, can be done in about 40 microseconds. Okay? And which means that after about three minutes, you can have taken five million samples, right? Five million samples is actually enough to extract the signal, and that is exactly what they did. Okay, they took several million samples, and then with a depth of 20, that was enough to extract the signal, right? You know, the number of samples that they would need would increase exponentially with the depth, you know, so that is why they stopped at depth 20, okay? Uh, and yeah, and, but, but depth 20 is still high enough that you've sort of scrambled things pretty well here, right? And every qubit has had many in opportunities to sort of interact with every other qubit in the grid. Okay? All right, good. So, questions about that? Yeah, so, uh, uh, so, so DC is just the distribution that you get by applying a circuit and then measuring, right? So, it, so it's determined by the circuit C. So you might say that the real question here is how should the circuit C be chosen, right? And um, so, so, you know, there were, you know, and, and this was actually, you know, this, this is where quantum computing theory comes in and, you know, where eventually math comes in, okay? This was sort of the conversation that uh, some of us had with the team at Google, you know, back in like 2014, you know, when they were making the decision of, you know, do they pursue this experiment, right? And, and what exactly do they do that would be interesting, right? And so there were, there were sort of a few requirements here. Um, the main one is that we want to be sampling from a distribution that a classical computer could not efficiently sample from. Okay, so we want to have high confidence that like we are sampling, you know, uh, 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 um, we are finding samples in a way that if we wanted a classical computer with a random number generator to do the same thing, well then yeah, of course in principle we could do it, but we would like it to take like two to the 53 computation time. Okay, now ironically, uh, we don't want it to be too much harder than that. Okay, now why not? Well, because, the, well, this brings me to the second point. Uh, we somehow need to verify that the quantum computer is doing what it is supposed to be doing. Okay? So, uh, you know, now, you know, we never directly observe, you know, as I said, this vector, right? We never see the probabilities. You know, if we repeated the experiment an astronomical number of times, Eventually, we could just form a, an empirical histogram of these probabilities, okay, but that would be way too expensive, right? As I said, there's, there's nine quadrillion of these things, okay? And, you know, and, and in practice, even if the experiment were running perfectly, we would expect to never even see the same output twice, okay? Because, you know, there's just some crazy probability distribution, okay? Uh, what, uh, no, 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 that is not what I said, no. We are seeing samples from this distribution over 53-bit strings, okay? We are then going to take those samples and we're going to do something with the samples. We are not separately measuring each qubit. I, I explained this before. We are seeing samples from this distribution, D sub C, okay? Which is a distribution over 0, 1 to the 53. We get, that's right, that's right. We get only five million samples. That is not nearly enough to sort of, you know, estimate these individual probabilities, you know, one by one, okay? So we have to do something different from that, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, if you like, yes. 
Yeah, so I get this extremely sparse information about you know, what the distribution was. Okay, but I do have one big thing in my favor, and that is that I know exactly what the distribution was supposed to have been, at least in principle. Okay, because I know the circuit C, right? I chose the circuit C. Okay, and so in principle, if I had enough computing power with my classical computer, I could calculate each of these ideal probabilities. Okay, and then ha having done that, let, let's suppose, I could then do a statistical test on the outputs and I could ask myself, are the outputs preferentially clustered among the ones that were supposed to be higher probability? Right, I can, do, I can start doing tests like that, okay? And in fact, that is exactly what we're going to do, okay? And I'll, I'll explain that and I'll explain why it works. Okay, but now for, uh, for now, the key point about it is that it requires, um, uh, um, um, you know, the, the only ways that we know to verify that the quantum computer was doing the right thing, you know, require a classical computation that itself takes two to the 53 time, right? Which means, you know, you could not do this experiment with 100 qubits, okay? Or rather, you could do it, but you would have no way to prove that, you know, that it had worked. Okay, because, you know, you cannot, you know, there is no supercomputer on Earth that can do 2 to the 100, okay? 2 to the 53 is just barely at the outer limit of what you could do with the largest supercomputers that are currently on the planet, okay? Uh, now, 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 in fact, what, what Google did do, you know, they, they, they did not... Um, um, directly verify their hardest circuits. They, they, they did a direct verification using a, a supercomputer that they had with one million cores uh, running for a month, okay? And they verified slightly easier circuits. Then they said, we're gonna make a plausible extrapolation up to, you know, the full uh, uh, 53 qubits and depth 20 circuits, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, to that point later. Uh, now, um, um, yeah. Well, because if the, de okay, a, that's a good question. The answer is that when the depth is too small, then there are classical simulation algorithms that work very well, okay? So yeah, so it comes back to, you know, this is really the key point, right? So for, you know, you know there, there have already been like, you know, years and years of people making dramatic announcements of I did this with a quantum computer, I did that with a quantum computer. If any of you followed this company called D-Wave, you know, they were pioneers in this, okay? Uh, and, you know, and, and almost all of it, like those of us who work in this field understood perfectly well that, you know, none of it outperforms what you could easily do with a classical computer. Right, and yeah, you know, somehow just that message, just you know, we had, we had a lot of trouble getting it out to the press because it was not what people wanted to hear, but it was the truth. Okay, and so you know, the goal, what's exciting about quantum supremacy is that at last you do want to directly target this question: Can you outperform a classical computer? Okay, and uh, yeah, and that means you have to think carefully about what is the best classical algorithm that could have spoofed the result that I saw. Right, and the classical algorithm might work in a completely different way than you know the quantum algorithm does, or that I think it's supposed to work. It just has to produce the same answer, right? That would convince me. Okay, so um, so these were exactly sort of the theoretical questions that co confronted us when we started thinking about this subject a decade ago. Of you know how uh, uh, how do you sample a distribution? where you have some confidence that it is classically hard to sample the same thing, how do you verify that, that you really were sampling from it? And then is it, you know, whatever test you're applying, how hard is it for a classical computer just to spoof that test? Okay, so, um, um, you know, one of the first proposals for, you know, proving quantum supremacy using a sampling problem uh, uh, along these lines was in 2011. It was by me and my student, Alex Arkhipov. It was something called boson sampling involving photonic quantum computers. Um, and, you know, independently of us, uh, Bremner, Joza, and Shepard had a similar proposal. And, you know, we were able to, um, you know, at least address this first part, right? 
and you know, give some complexity theoretic evidence why there should not be an efficient classical algorithm to sample the same distributions that we are sampling from, right? You know, we couldn't prove it. I mean, in the present state of computational complexity, you know, we can, we, we can unconditionally prove uh, very, very little of what we would like to prove, right? We can't even prove P is different from NP. Okay, but uh, um, um, but you know we could give uh, reduction evidence that just if there's a fast algorithm for if there's a fast classical algorithm to sample these distributions, that a lot of very surprising things would happen. Okay, so that's sort of what set the stage for you know uh, Google in 2014, 2015, which you know they were deciding what to do. They said we want to do something like boson sampling, but with the hardware that we have, and we'll also you know we'll need to verify the results somehow, and you know we're going to leave it to the theorists to sort of adapt the you know. Uh, uh, theoretical arguments to that situation. So we said, okay, we'll, uh, we'll take that deal. <laughs> and uh, 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 so, so, the, so the proposal that they ended up going forward with um, is just called um, random circuit sampling. Okay, so it's one of the simplest things you could possibly imagine. Um, so, so in their experiment, uh, the circuit C is just going to be chosen randomly, okay, from like so the, from some ensemble, you know, over like all possible, you know, uh, 53 qubit depth 20 circuits that sort of have this general structure, right? But like the uh, the, uh, the the coupling strength, like the exact the specific matrices that you have you know the one, specific one and two qubit gates that you ask to be applied will be chosen randomly, okay? And um, so you just get the random circuit. It basically, just mixes things up, things up and makes some complicated, arbitrary-looking state that looks kind of like complete garbage, to be honest, okay? But it's very specific garbage. Okay, it is garbage that if you know C, then in principle you can exactly calculate, right? And we are now gonna, you know, the whole experiment is gonna be looking for correlations between the measured outputs and like our predictions, you know, for, for this garbage, right? You know, for like which outcomes, uh, w w which 53-bit strings were predicted to be like slightly more likely than other 53-bit strings. Okay, so um, so let's um, let's first say maybe what does uh, this state psi sub c look like? So you know after I've applied a random quantum circuit of depth twenty to my fifty three qubits, what kind of state will I have? Right? What will what, what can we say like in general about its like statistical pro properties? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can. Well, well, the samples are going to be sampled by nature, by the Born rule, by quantum mechanics. We can, in principle, we can calculate the probability for seeing each possible sample. Analytically. Analytically. Yeah. Analytically. Because we know the circuit C, right? And it's just a bunch of matrix vector multiplies, albeit with two to the fifty-three by two to the fifty-three matrices. Okay? So in principle, yeah, you can if you have a big enough computer, you can do that. And you can calculate what is supposed to be the full probability distribution. Right? Uh, now that, that, that that's that's not how it's actually gonna be done. I'll explain what, what will actually happen. Okay? But um um uh, so, so, so this state, psi sub c, this result of applying a random circuit to uh, the all zero initial state, okay, uh, uh, you know, as I said, it, it looks like just like a, a pretty random looking quantum state. But now, what is a random state? Well, intuitively, a random state would just be a random unit vector in c to the 2 to the 53. Right? So, you know, take this huge dimensional space, you know, just pick a random point on the unit circle. Okay? Uh, now, 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 it is not exactly that. We know that it can't be that because a, ra a truly random point on the unit circle would require 2 to the 53 parameters even just to specify it. 
right? And, and uh, whereas I have specified this state just by specifying a circuit C that has much, much fewer parameters than that, you know, only like a thousand parameters, okay? So this is not a truly random state, but if you like, it is a pseudo-random state, okay? For almost all statistical purposes that we care about, it will behave as if it was a random, you know, just a random unit vector. Uh, uh, in some cases, we can now even analytically prove that, okay? That is, we can, you know, there are many circuit ensembles where, it, you know, we, one can now analytically prove that, you know, the, at least the individual amplitudes approach what they would be if this was just a random point in, in you know, in, in C to the 2 to the N. Okay, in other cases, we, you know, or like when the depth is a little smaller and so forth, we can't prove it. But we know it. We, we you know we uh, uh, know it to be true by the physicist standards. You know we ran it in MATLAB or whatever. <laughs> okay, and uh, um, uh, and now what does a random state look like? Well, does anyone know? Like if you're programming your computer to sample a random uh, uh, unit vector, how, uh, uh, what, what's a good way to do that? Anyone know? In in R to the n. What? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, so one of you know, the most elegant ways to generate a random unit vector is that I would just generate a bunch of independent Gaussians, right? So in this case, let's say complex Gaussians, okay? Uh, comp uh, you know, in this case, it would have to be uh, uh, two to the n of them, right? And then I would take the result and I would just project it, you know, or so I would just normalize it so now it becomes a unit vector. Okay, so what this is, you know, and the normalization, you know, is, is uh, uh, you, know, you know, because of the law of large numbers, right, the sum is, you know, is pretty well under control. And so, 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 so basically each of the amplitudes will look like an IID Gaussian, okay? Each amplitude in my, uh, uh, each in, in my final quantum state will look like a, com uh, a complex Gaussian with mean zero, right? Uh, uh, Average, you know, the average absolute value would be of order one over square root of two to the n, okay? And um, so, you know, my 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 amplitudes just look like a bunch of uh, well, uh, I'm I'm not good at, at sampling a Gaussian on the whiteboard, okay? But but uh, you know they'll you know they'll look like uh, 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 they're they're just drawn from this. IID Gaussian ensemble. Okay, now, uh, you know, this, this is actually interesting. Okay, this is different from what would happen with like a classical mixing process, right? A classical mixing process would tend to just converge to the uniform distribution, right, after some amount of time, right? I would just, you know, have, you know, I would just get closer and closer to it, and then you know, all of my probabilities would be nearly the same. Okay, but that is not what happens quantum mechanically. Okay, so, you know, quantum mechanically, I never converge to a uniform distribution. You know, instead I get probabilities, each of which is the absolute square of, you know, a draw from this, you know, a Gaussian ensemble. And so, you know, as you can see, they have different magnitudes, right? You know, they're all going to be exponentially small, right? So if you like, all of my probabilities will be tiny, okay? But some will be appreciably tinier than others. Okay, like, you know, like by factors of three or, or two and, and so on. Okay, now um, um, one way to understand what's going on is uh, in terms of quantum interference, which, you know, Richard Feynman used to say is like the central thing of quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, you know, we can represent each final amplitude in our quantum circuit, so each alpha sub x, as a sum over exponentially many different contributions. Okay, so, uh, um, um, you know, like, like basically it's a sum over, there's an amplitude for each possible path that you could have taken through, you know, the space of 53-bit strings where you would end up at x. Okay, each one contributes some amplitude to the total. Okay, but now, you know, if you have a sum of many contributions, you know, they're pointing every which way in the complex plane. I mean, this is what leads to Gaussian behavior, if you like, right? It's just, you know, law of large numbers. You're summing a bunch of Gaussians, you know, or sorry, you're summing a bunch of, you know, not quite independent, but quasi-independent contributions of mean zero. And, um, 
And, and sometimes, you know, so, so, you, so what you, get, you get a lot of destructive interference. That is, you know, these different contributions to alpha sub x are pointing in different directions in the complex plane, and they mostly cancel each other out. Okay, but if you like, what is going on is that for some x's, that cancellation happens more perfectly than it does for other x's, right? For some of them, you are left with more of a, a larger residue after all of that cancellation has happened than you are with others, okay? So now, as I said, so, so let's, let's be a little bit more precise. As I said, the Born rule of quantum mechanics says that the probability of each possible string is just the squared absolute value of its amplitude, okay? So now the question, uh, you know, so, so, uh, so a mathematical question is as follows. If each um, amplitude is uh, an IID Gaussian, so I guess, uh, 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 um, you know, so each, so each, so each amplitude is a, is a complex Gaussian like this, then how will its squared absolute value be distributed? Okay. And now, uh, this, is, this is just a beautiful little mathematical, what? Uh, not, not uh, um, let's see, it, it's actually not chi-squared in this case. I claim that in this case, uh, this will actually be exponentially distributed. Okay. It will, it will, it will go, you know, just like uh, uh, e to the minus x. Okay, you know, with a mean of, uh, you know, a mean, of course, of 2 to the minus n. Okay? Uh, now, this, this is only true because these are complex numbers, right? If, the, if these were reals, uh, it would, uh, I guess it would be chi-squared in that case. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if, the, if they were, right, if they were quaternions, it would again be something else. With complex numbers, only with complex numbers, interestingly, do you get exactly the exponential distribution here. Okay, and now this is a beautiful fact. Uh, it is uh, a, uh, a favorite fact of my friend, the mathematician Greg Cooperberg at UC Davis, and he um, um, loves to point out how this is um, 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 almost the same fact as a fact that was discovered by Archimedes in 200 BC. Okay, uh, so what uh, Archimedes did, uh, you might recall, is uh, um, uh, uh, well, one of, one of many things he did is that he was the first to calculate the surface area of the sphere, you know, that it is 4 pi r squared. Okay, but even more interesting than that was the way that he proved it, and that was to show that a sphere has exactly the same surface area as uh, that of a cylinder that perfectly encloses that sphere, right? If, uh, uh, you know, we don't count the top or the bottom, we don't count the, you know, uh, uh, but only the sort of round part, the, 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 the cylindrical part, uh, you know, and, 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 and that is easily calculated to be 4 pi r squared, you know, and hence the sphere is as well. Now, the way that Archimedes proved that this and this have the same surface area uh, uh, was, um, by dividing the sphere into a bunch of really thin slices like this. And then, um, you know, I mean, the, the, we're again, you know, this is how we did it, you know, of course, without calculus, which hadn't been invented yet, okay. And, and he then um, showed that each of these thin slices actually has exactly, these uh, uh, annular sections, I guess, has exactly the same surface area as its projection. You know, there's just a projection of it. Uh, uh, horizontally onto the cylinder, okay? And, you know, what makes that uh, kind of surprise it, okay, so it's clear that that's what happens in the very middle, right? But, you know, he claims that, th that that continues to happen even as you go up. Yeah, yeah, right, and there, there are two different effects here. One of them is that, you know, well, the sphere, you know, the, the, the radius all the way around is getting smaller and smaller, but the other thing that's happening is that it's curving inwards. And so the same distance here corresponds to a longer distance over there, right? And the, the great insight of Archimedes was that these two effects precisely cancel each other out, right? And yeah, there's a little geometric proof that you can give for that, okay? But, you know, what it means is that even as you go up, you know, each of these little annular sections, all of them have exactly the same area, right, uh, uh, as each other and, uh, you know, as their projections onto the cylinder, okay? And what happens in going from 
here to here is actually very similar to that. Okay, it's um, uh, you know we we look at the the Ga Gaussian measure on sort of complex space, and uh, we you know we're now taking the absolute squares of, of the results. Okay, and uh, uh, um, you know, so, so these annular sections that we have to look at are getting larger and larger. But also, because of the squaring, you know, we, we're going to be looking at thinner and thinner slices. And those two effects precisely cancel each other out. And, you know, and basically you're left with just the exponential distribution with no other contribution to it. If you don't believe me, uh, you know, this is a calculation that prob probably anyone in a math department should be able to do. Okay, and uh, so so basically we get uh, you know there's a name for this. Um, it's called a uh, uh, so so we get a distribution over distributions, if you like, right? So so we get a you know a meta distribution, right, where the probabilities are these exponentially distributed random variables, uh, and uh, that type of ensemble over probability distributions. Uh, well, the physicists, anyway, have a name for it. They call it the Porter-Thomas distributions. Okay, so we get uh, Porter-Thomas behavior. And what this means in particular is because each of the, the, the probabilities, you know, are these exponentially distributed random variables, you know, of, of mean 2 to the minus n, well, you know, they have fluctuations that are large enough to, in principle, be detected. You know, some of them, you know, might be 2 times 2 to the minus n. Others might be, you know, 0.8 times 2 to the minus n, and so forth, right? They have uh, little fluctuations. And so now I can finally tell you what is the statistical test that Google applied to, its, uh, uh, to the samples that, uh, that they got. So what they did, so let's say that they took K samples. K is a few million. Uh, 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 you know, they call the samples S1 up to SK. Okay, so each of these samples is a 53-bit string. Okay, then um, what they did is they just, using a classical computer, they calculate the probability for each sample, so that is uh, uh, using you know using their no, you know using their knowledge of the circuit C. Uh, so that so, so this is just the amplitude for the final amplitude for that S sub i. If the uh, 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 you know if if we start with the all zero state and we apply the circuit C, that's what this notation means. And then we take the absolute square of that to get a probability. Okay, so this is sort of the ideal probability for the string S sub i to be sampled by the circuit C. We compute these numbers for each of the samples S sub i that we saw, and then we simply sum them all up. And we consider the test to have passed if and only if this sum exceeds some threshold. Okay, so now we're going to, let's discuss the question of what threshold. Um, well, you know, if I, suppose I was just picking these S sub i's completely at random, just, you know, with no, with no, not even, no knowledge of C, totally naively. Well, the average value of the probabilities is, is 2 to the minus n, right? That's the, that's their expectation, right? There's, you know, there's certain, there are 2 to the minus 53, right? There's, there's 2 to the 53 probabilities, they add up to 1. Um, so if, if I took K of them, then you know I, the expect the expectation for this sum is going to be k over two to the n, right? So achieving a value of this sum that's k over two to the n that is trivial to do, right? But now what about if these S sub i's were being sampled using a perfect quantum computer, you know, with no error, no, no noise? Well then. This is just an integral that one can do, right? You just integrate over the exponential distribution, you know, and you know, the, intuitively, those S sub i's with larger probabilities should be appearing more often, which means, which is going to weight this sum toward being larger, right? And when you do the integral, what you get is that it's exactly a factor of two here, okay? So with a perfect quantum computer, you would get 
2k over 2 to the n as the expected value for this sum. Okay, so in general, we'll say that, you know, let's say you get some b times k over 2 to the n, where b is, you know, with a noisy device is going to be some uh, 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 value between 1 and 2. Now, uh, uh, when, you know, uh, um, when they did the experiment, the result that they uh, say that they got is b equals 1.002. Okay, so you may notice that this is very far from the ideal quantum value of two. Okay, but you know it is larger than the trivial value of one. Okay, and the point is that they were able to take enough samples to actually prove that this 1.002 is not just a noisy one. It is larger than one. It is you know it is separated from one. Okay, and and then the point of the theoretical analysis that we did was to try to uh, argue about what is the classical hardness of spoofing a test like this one. Okay, so to, the, to give a name to it, uh, Google called this the, um, the linear cross entropy benchmark. It's not, this is not actually an entropy, but so, you know, uh, the, the name is a, a little bit silly. But, uh, um, but the, the, that's what it's called. It's called linear cross entropy benchmark. Okay, and so um, my uh, 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 an undergrad at UT named Sam Gunn and I have a paper a few months ago, building on the earlier work that that uh, I and others did, but just sort of adapting it to you know this specific benchmark that Google was applying, and we study the question. How hard would it be for a classical computer to spoof the linear cross entropy benchmark, right? By which we mean, how hard is it for a classical computer to just do anything whatsoever, I don't care what, to just produce a set of samples that would also achieve a B that was bounded above what? Like, you know, achieve a B like this one, okay? And now we cannot rule out that such a classical algorithm might exist, okay? You know, we, you know, we'd have to prove p not equal to np and so forth, you know, to, 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 before, to do that, okay? But what we were able to show was that at any rate, if there is a fast classical algorithm that could spoof this benchmark, you know, and, and sort of look like it was, you know, do, you know, doing the same thing that the quantum computer did, then there would also be a fast classical algorithm that could take uh, as input a random quantum circuit like this one, and um, it could estimate some particular amplitude of interest to you, like let's say the final amplitude of the all zero state. Uh, so this one here, uh, um, or, or let's say the absolute square of that amplitude. Right now, if I asked you to estimate an amplitude like this one, you know, the most tri naive thing you could possibly do is say uh, about two to the minus n. Right, because you know, I mean, I mean that that that's the expectation, right? You know, we know that these things average to two to the minus n, so you could just guess. Yeah, I think it's about two to the minus n. You know, a little more, a little less. Okay, but you know, intuitively, like in, unless you actually simulate this quantum circuit with your classical computer, it seems hard to do sort of even slightly better than that. Right? How do you get an estimator of this amplitude you know, that's even a little bit better than the trivial estimator that just always guesses the same value? Right? So what um, Sam Gunn and I uh, showed is that if you have a fast classical algorithm to spoof the linear cross entropy benchmark, then you also have a fast classical algorithm that could take a specific amplitude of interest and it can estimate it a little bit better than the, the trivial estimator does. Okay, by a little bit better, I, I really mean a little bit, like uh, eight to the minus n better, or n's the number of qubits, okay? But that's not something that we know how to do by any known classical algorithm, okay? Um, we know how to do uh, uh, like one over exponential in the number of gates better, okay? Uh, where m here is like a thousand is the number of gates, but not this much better, okay? And, um, so, yeah, you would have to do something at least somewhat surprising 
And, you know, and, and, and basically what we're saying is that there's nothing really special about s the problem of spoofing this benchmark, right? Or even just doing it slightly, right? And, and by the way, it doesn't matter how much noise there is, right? Even if this is like 1.002, it still has this implication, okay? So if you can spoof this benchmark even a little bit, then you must have made progress on the general problem of just estimating amplitudes in arbitrary quantum circuits, doing that with a classical computer. Okay, and so far, no one knows how to solve such problems in any amount of time that is really less than 2 to the 53 power. Okay? And so as long as that remains, you know, you know, then you might have heard that IBM posted a whole rebuttal paper to Google and there was a whole back and forth about it. Okay, but all of that was sort of about getting down to the, this 2 to the 53, you know, and not being worse than 2 to the 53. None of it was about breaching this barrier, right? And as long as this remains sort of a lower bound on the time for a classical computer to simulate these 53 qubit quantum circuits, so then that is sort of what the case for quantum supremacy is based on. So um, I apologize for going over, but I'm happy to just at this point take whatever questions people have, and, and thanks for listening. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I want to understand something. Yeah. I'm not sure I understood here. Okay, sure. Because the, the, the random distribution yes. will, for a coin stick in the unit ball is right. a very large uh, field space. Yes. Um, do, you, do you take this as a, compar a comparison with what you get when you take a, a, a random circuit and you pick the kind of random circuit you are using? Um, uh, Yes. And uh, you look at the associated distribution. Yes. And it looks like the, mm -hmm. the, the pure, uh, purely. Uh, yes, yes. I'm saying with respect to most of the statistical tests that we would care about, it looks like a hard random state, meaning yeah, a uniform. Is surprising to you? Well, no, no, it's not surprising. Yeah, uh, but I, I, think yeah. I don't believe it. Okay. Uh, I mean, you may not, uh, it's not important to you, but. It's, well. It is important, it's and it's true. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. You find situations where the, the random circuit is specified, even random, random yeah, the yeah, random circuit yeah. is specified in such a way mm -hmm. that you would find a non, uh, a non uniformly distributed, quote unquote. Uh huh. Well, so, so let, me, let me be more precise about what I am claiming. I am claiming that each of the individual you know, amplitudes you know, is nearly IID Gaussian. I'm claiming that if you look at the joint distribution over any small number of amplitudes, then they are jointly close to IID Gaussian, okay? All right, right. Uh, you know, if, if you look at all of them together, I already said, I said in the talk that it is not har random because there are not, ne and it cannot be because it has not nearly enough degrees of freedom to be. Yeah, I, I said that. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Uh, what about qubits? How yeah. Do Doesn't change anything. That's the that's the short answer. Does it improve or anything? Improves nothing. Changes nothing. Okay. You know, all it means is that instead of like two to the n, now it's d to the n, right? But the you know the log of ba well for me logs are base two, so the log of two to the n is n. The log of d to the n is n times log of d. So now it, you know it changes n by a prefactor. That's the only effect. So we don't even incur that effect earlier or from a UD perspective. I mean, I mean, yes, there might be advantages, you know, you know, just uh, but but like like if you had a you know like a four-level system, I'm just going to call that two qubits, right? Like I don't care. It's a, you know this is a, you know just this is this is a question for you know the uh, at sort of the engineering layer, right? You know, and, and like by the time you know we're thinking about quantum algorithms, we can just think in terms of qubits. It's exactly the same as with classical computing, right? Where like in the early days, in the 40s and 50s, people were like, oh, we could build computers that use base three or that use base ten, and you know it took them like a decade to realize, well, there's no point to any of that because bits can encode anything you want them to, right? And so you might as well just do what, the, what is the simplest thing and use bits, right? Yeah? Just curious, how do you, how do you, how do you 
Yeah. Randomly see the, the gate. Yeah. And if they, in, in the space of all the gates, all possible gates, could, could all the gates scramble all the bits in such a way that zero, zero, all, all the permutation of zero and one? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, you know, you, you certainly get a distribution that has support on all two to the 53 strings, right? Because in order for that not to be the case, at least one of the amplitudes would have to be exactly zero, right? But that would require a cancellation that is so precise that it would, like, very rarely happen, right? So, so typically, yeah, absolutely, all two to the 53 strings will have non-zero probabilities, and that will already be true, like, after the very first one or two layers. Yeah, yeah. And how do they randomize the, the Oh, uh, with a random number generator on their computer, I assume. Classical. Yeah, on a classical computer. Now, now one, you know, uh, a quibble that people may have with the experiment as it stands is that Google chose the circuits, right? And if they were sufficiently evil, right, you know, even I guess their, their motto used to be don't be evil, but if they ignored their motto, right, then, then they, you know, maybe they could have chosen the circuit in some way that it was secretly easier to simulate. You know, I'm actually not sure how they would have done that. That itself is an interesting question, okay? But, uh, um, you know, you could say maybe it would be more satisfactory for someone else to generate the challenge circuits send them to Google, and then Google, not having seen the circuit before, has to very quickly send back the samples, which will then be verified by the outside person, right? Okay. That, what? How can they do it? The outside well, with a, with a very large supercomputer. <laughs> that's, that, that's, yeah, yeah, ask IBM, exactly. Ask IBM to commandeer Summit at Oak Ridge National Labs, which is the largest supercomputer on the planet and which has, fills two basketball courts and has 250 petabytes of hard disk. And if you want to simulate, you know, these 53 qubit uh, uh, quantum computers in any reasonable amount of time, that looks right now like the only computer on Earth that would be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you want to emulate uh, a given Gibbs distribution yes. on the, the set of the lattice of the yeah. Theory, yes. Binary. Okay. So you would, it's possible, I suppose, with mm -hmm. this specific circuit, mm -hmm. which would have, uh, how do you give the weight? Uh, yeah, so, okay. So, so, so. So Gibbs sampling is an in a very interesting problem. Uh, people have studied quantum algorithms for Gibbs sampling. That's a very different problem from what I've been talking about, right? Completely different, okay? Uh, but there are um, um, algorithms that uh, uh, in some cases can get what's called a Grover speed up for Gibbs sampling problems. And that means like that a quantum computer can sometimes solve Gibbs sampling problems in about the square root of the number of steps that a classical computer would have needed to solve them. Okay, or you know, uh, at least with, with, with known methods. Okay, and, and this is, uh, um, uh, um, you know, that this is based on something called Grover's algorithm, uh, amplitude amplification. Uh, if you're interested, you could, I, I can point you to papers about it, uh, you know, or you could just type quantum Gibbs sampling and, and, and your quantum algorithm for Gibbs sampling into Google. And Wait, really? Uh, well, well, I, I had not heard about that. Uh, okay, well, uh, a lot of stuff is being sold that, you know, <laughs> a lot of claims are being made about them, and, you know, I try to sort out what's true. Uh, I had not heard the thing about Mitsubishi. Uh, yeah, I, I, I totally had not heard the thing about Mitsubishi. I mean, what I do know about is, like, uh, you know, D-Wave, for example, you know, has spent a, by now has spent a long time claiming that they have a you know, a quantum, you know, a commercially practical quantum computer for, you know, solving um, optimization problems and, and in particular for Gibbs sampling. The central issue uh, for those of us in this field, I would say, is that they have not made the case that they are actually getting a, any advantage over what you could do with a classical computer if you do a fair comparison. Right? And furthermore, with qubits of the quality that they have, you know, we would be extremely surprised if there were any such advantage to be had there. Okay? And you know, so it, 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 you know, it is now empirically demonstrated 
that you can you know, have enormous success as a quantum computing company just by talking to investors and business people who are excited that you did something quantumly because quantum means the future and who will never even ask the question of could a classical computer have done it just as well before they give you $30 million or whatever, okay? And that is a path to great success in this field, um, you know, because, you know, the yeah, because people don't read my blog. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, okay. So, 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 so that that question is a little bit subtle because what we can prove is that for a black box searching task, like let's say I just have a space of possible solutions, and all I know is how to recognize which solution is the right one, right? In that kind of scenario, we can prove a theorem that Grover's algorithm is the best that even a quantum computer can do. You can get the square root speed up and nothing more, okay? Now, the problem is, well, in, in the real world, you know, nothing is, uh, you know, c truly a black box, right? And you could say, you know, what we really care about is, let's say, some minimizing some objective function, right? Or solving some optimization problem. Right, where you know, there's some additional structure there. Right? It's not just a black box. I can look at the actual constraints you know, that I have. I can try to see if there's some symmetry in them. I can use some backtracking algorithm. I can use some local search, some you know, simulated annealing. Right? There, there's all kinds of things I can do now. And that, so, so once you're outside of the black box setting, then Grover's algorithm becomes is merely the best that we know how to do. Right? And, you know, like, like, like generically, you could say, right? And in, in some special cases, there will be structure that you can exploit the, to do even better than Grover's algorithm. And actually, Shor's algorithm, the one for factoring, is precisely an example of that. It's where you notice that your problem has some extremely special structure, and you then, chore you know, design a different quantum algorithm that can choreograph an interference pattern that takes advantage of that structure and actually gets an exponential speed up. So way better than a square root speed up, right? In the generic setting, in the, well, in the black box setting, we know it's only a square root speed up. And now a plausible conjecture in the field for the last 25 years has been that like for NP complete problems, generically, that square root speed up from the black box setting will be the best that you can do. But that there's no proof of. And if there was an unconditional proof of that statement, then it would also prove P is not equal to NP. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Would be the effect, which is the depth in oh yeah. Well, well, once you have fault tolerance, then there is no longer a practical limit on depth. Okay, that's the entire point of fault tolerance, right? The whole point is to eliminate these severe restrictions on the depth, you know, and and to say, you know, we know now, you know, we want to protect our qubits, right? You know, encode them in a way where they're not going to be decaying exponentially with time, but they're just going to stay there. Okay, and then you could do depth a million, depth a hundred million, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Right, thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you, yeah, I'll see sure. you. Yeah, 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 yeah. hey. All right, sure.